Okay, so welcome everybody uh, to this uh, Monday seminar. It is a big pleasure to announce uh, Andrew Lundgren from the University of Portsmouth to everybody. Uh, Andrew did his PhD at Cornell University in 2008 and moved on to uh, two postdocs in Syracuse and Pennsylvania. And since 2017, he's been a reader at the uh, Institute for Cosmology and Gravitation in Portsmouth, where he uh, leads uh, various activities within the LIGO group. He was actually the founder of the, the LIGO group in, in Portsmouth. And today he will uh, tell us about searching for the next big thing with gravitational waves. So take okay. it away. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be here. Um, and I don't really need the first time to do it. Uh, Mark um, So I, I just uh, briefly point out a couple of things. Uh, so I did my undergraduate at MIT. Um, adiabatic quantum computing before it was cool. If anyone wants to hear about that, um, not in this stuff. I, I mostly studied theoretical gravity um, at Cornell, and then I started LIGO in 2008. So I've been here more than 10 years now. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about the first gravitational wave detection, which happened when I was in Hanover. Um, and uh, I guess my main Leadership role in LIGO has been uh, in the detective characterization group. Um, so, part of my talk is going to be explaining what that actually is and why it's so important. It's not something that any other collaboration really has. It's, uh, I think astronomers call it a different thing, um, but it's, it's basically what I'm known for in LIGO, um, along with searches. Um, and yeah, our group now at Portsmouth is three faculty, four postdocs, a research software engineer, and I'll say a little bit about what that is and five students plus two graduated in the last couple of weeks. Um, and we are more or less the, uh, the same as you, uh, Institute of Cosmology and Gravitation, it's almost the same as ICC. Um, so I want to talk about, uh, just start by uh, reminding you of the gravitational wave results to date. Um, there's a lot of them. If you haven't been paying attention the last couple of years, it's changed a lot. Um, and I'm really going to be talking about gravitational wave data analysis. It, I actually got kind of technical, but it's, um, it's a field that's actually, the, the more I learn about it, learn about how to analyze this data, the more it just seems to be the same as what everyone else is doing. So there's kind of a common Bayesian uh, and statistical language that everyone uses uh, that I think will let you actually understand what I'm talking about, even if you go into technical detail. Um, and then I'm just going to review some of the challenges uh, and talk about some of the things I've done uh, covering the entire search space. Um, detector artifacts and some cool pictures of those. non stationarity selection bias, and then I might finish up a little bit by just telling you a little bit more about my group. Um, and I don't think there's any way of getting rid of the screen sharing thing. Uh, so the observing timeline. Um, like I said, we detected gravitational waves the first time in 2015, um, right here. And I'm pointing four days to the left of when the run actually was scheduled to start. Uh, we hadn't even officially started the science run when we found the first gravitational wave. And it was not what we expected. Uh, it was a binary black hole of more mass than we were ever in before, uh, or knew it was going to be out there. Um, and we're now here. So, you know, there's obviously a gap here. There was planned to be a little bit of a gap. This was supposed to run a little bit longer, and that was supposed to start a lot sooner. Uh, but obviously, COVID got in the way. Um, but we break our science into observing runs. We run the detector for a couple months at a time and upgrade. Uh, and it's getting better and better every time. Um, Virgo joined us in 02 um, and is now more sensitive and is aiming for to double their sensitivity. Kyra has joined us. Um, and they're, they're not quite the same sensitivity as everyone else yet, uh, but they're working on it. Uh, and then we're going to do another year of run coming up soon. And then 05 is kind of the last one where we have really solid plans of what we're doing with the detectors. So we've got a plan upgrades, which are obviously going to increase the sensitivity of the detector um, by quite a lot. And then after that, uh, there will be a gap where we're going to have to develop new technology. Uh, I'll say a little bit about that. Um, one thing, when I talk about ranges here, these are for a binary neutron star. It's kind of a historic artifact of the fact that, well, binary neutron stars are all the same masses, uh, 1.4 solar masses. So we can see them to a certain distance. Um, binary black holes, the stronger the signal gets, 
uh, well, the more massive they get, the stronger the signal gets. So, um, yeah, neutron stars. This is uh, all the masses um, that we've seen so far, I think. Um, and you can see the neutron stars down here. We've got just a couple because you can't see them very far. And then if you went to the Milky Way and asked, you know, what kind of black holes you see, 10 to 20 is about um, normal. But then, uh, yeah, we've seen the first detection was 30, math, uh, 30 solar masses and 30 solar masses merging to about 60. And this is about 10% of its mass in just the gravitational waves in the last second or two. So, uh, I mean, you think 10, uh, oh, what was that, like six solar masses lost um, just the gravitational waves in a split second. That's probably the most energetic thing in the universe. But luckily, it doesn't couple very strongly. Um, anything else? Uh, you can see some really big black holes up there, too. Um, it's easier to see it like this. So um, in yellow, are the neutron stars that we know about in our galaxy, you can see this lump around 1.4 solar masses, um, up to two or a little bit more. All those are a little bit insecure. Black holes don't go down very far, and they maybe go up to 20 in the Milky Way. Because the Milky Way, probably it's because we're pretty high in velocity, being an evolved galaxy. Um, it takes very low velocity to have a star that's really, really big, um, because it doesn't cool it effectively. And so it will be a big remnant. Um, so if you go back further in time, when um, the universe was more pristine, you can get more of these kind of black holes. But there's still plenty in the 10 to 20 range. We didn't see them at first because they're weaker. Um, you know, the, these we can see much further away. We'll see them out to gigaparsecs. Um, these are closer. And um, the first one of these that we saw was actually 40 megaparsecs. And then you can see a couple here above where we would have even thought that it's possible to form a black hole directly from the start. Um, that block has a lot of small dots on it. Um, and here's kind of the reality. Uh, I don't like this plot very much, it's kind of a mess. Um, uh, the, the color ones here are just uh, different sort of interesting events. Um, we'll focus on these in a bit. Uh, but it, this shows you kind of how well we can measure things, and the answer is not very. Um, this one's a good example here. People online can see where I'm pointing. Um, maybe not. Well, they see the camera, so they should see okay. uh, Yeah, I'll try to do it. Uh, but my yeah, my mouse point's not working. Um, so yeah, uh, look at this yellow one here. You can see that it's got this kind of arch shape. It's the uh, chirp mass is very well determined. Um, so there's this particular combination. That's the thing that determines the, the overall evolution of the waveform. But the mass ratio is just not very well determined. So the first thing that you want to know are what are the individual masses. And you can't really know that until we get much higher SNR. Um, we don't resolve that. We resolve the chirp mass, which is kind of like a total mass, but not quite. Uh, and then the ratio of the masses kind of hard to measure. I mean, we can obviously tell if it's close to equal mass. You can see close to equal mass versus like one to three, we can't really tell. Um, but if something's way down here, we can tell that the mass ratio is pretty unequal. Um, and then, yeah, as you go up higher and higher, you get less and less accuracy, and these are just sort of a big blob. Um, and this gets even worse when you add the fact that they can spin or anything else that you want to measure. Um, so here's a slightly cleaner plot. Uh, with just a few interesting events. Um, so I've mostly selected things from O3, uh, which is maybe a mistake. We saw most of the cool stuff in O1 and O2. Um, but let's see, which one do I want to talk about here? Uh, the top one, you can see that, um, so M sharp is this mass combination that I mentioned. It's going to be a little less than the total mass. So this is very, very massive. Um, there's 50 up here at the top. It is going to be something uh, above 50 solar masses in one of the single objects. And current stability supernovas are supposed to blow those stars apart without even a black hole remnant. So uh, since we detected that, 
there have now been papers saying that maybe that doesn't happen. Um, so we've we've driven, I think, more uh, more work in astrophysical theory than anything else uh, because a lot of our detections are pretty hard to explain. Um, you can see here that this this one, uh, the fourth one down, is interesting because it's very unequal masses. We see this preference um, astrophysically for um, for pretty equal masses, and that's not just really a selection effect. It, in in some sense, it is because they are louder. Um, but there's there's clearly a preference in the population for something like that. Um, <clears throat> And then, yeah, we get things that are kind of just high mass, and then the, the lower mass is there. Um, luminosity distance, you can see how far away they are. We don't do this very well yet, um, unfortunately, uh, because the orientation of the binary means that we can't really tell uh, how loud it should be. So there's always going to be this error on the, uh, on the distance. Um, so one, two, maybe three gigaparsecs. It's the typical thing for a binary black hole now. Um, and um, if we had, if say Virgo's detection, uh, if Virgo's sensitivity improves, or we get Kagra or like India online, um, then we're really going to break some of the geometry that will help that. The problem with the two LIGO detectors is they're basically oriented the same way, they pick up the same polarization, they can't really break the degeneracy of distance with that inclination. Um, and then for spins, this is the other really unexpected thing. We thought there would be spins. Um, black holes start spin when they collapse, they're going to hold on to that spin. Um, with a few exceptions, there's not really strong aligned spins. So you'd expect that if the binaries are forming together, they're going to hold on to a lot of, they're going to have the same spin. They're going to hold on to that spin when they form. Um, and then you can pick that up in the waveform. And that's just not really the case. The spins are kind of misaligned. We don't have any that are really strong misaligned, like you'd expect from the Dahlberg cluster. Uh, some of them are actually anti-aligned, um, like more than just random, they're anti-aligned. So with spins, we also have just no idea what's going on. Um, just one thing, just seeing this, uh, the fourth one down, uh, you don't measure the spins. Also, you measure the sum of the spins, and it's kind of weighted by the mass. So if one of the masses is much bigger, you're just going to see the spin of that one. Yeah. So about the um, mass ratio, how do you know that it's not entirely essentially biased? Um, Is that because of astrophysical model? Or? Uh, good question. Um, so I haven't shown it here, but we do have population models where we put in selection biases and all those sort of things to, to try to infer it. Um, I guess the reason that I say this is not selection bias is just because this is one of those. And that these ratios are not so high, also that you're going to get um, a, a really huge discrepancy in the, the loudness. Um, I mean, you are going to favor these a little bit more, but if you look at the, the entire set of them, it's not enough to really explain it. So, so you say you might the sum of the spin will be the most popular. No, what you say about the spins? Uh, about the spins, the thing that we measure best really is the, the sum of the spins weighted by the masses. Uh, because uh, obviously this thing can't, the, this spin orbit coupling, this little thing can't push the big thing around. If they had spins, the little one is not going to really affect the orbit very much, whereas the, the bigger ones are. So it's the sum of the spins uh, projected onto the orbital plane that we really measure well. And then if you've got the spins really outside the orbital plane, what happens is the orbit will wobble and you get precession. Uh, that's one of the things that I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, so two other things to mention, going back to this plot, uh, they're now highlighted on here. Um, it's worth saying that at this point, we still can't tell a neutron star from a black hole other than by its mass. Um, neutron stars obviously do have tidal forces, they're, they're made of matter, so there are going to be some effects, but they're at surprisingly high um, order. Um, they don't really the, the difference between a point mass and a, um, an extended body really isn't um, all that extreme. So with the current detectors, we can't really tell um, directly whether something's a neutron star or a black hole. <coughs> so it's kind of just looking at this. We just put a line and say, well, um, anything above 2.5 probably can't be a neutron star. Well, certainly above 3 definitely can't. And then um, depending on what the equation of state is, 
they may be up here or here, there might be some limit. Um, we've seen some neutron stars at about two pretty securely. Um, so there's a good chance that this is a black hole neutron star. Um, and then this is almost, I guess, almost certainly a black hole neutron star, but it's a weaker signal, so it's, uh, it's hard to tell. Um, but this sort of, it's nice for us because it sort of completes the things that we found. We found binary black holes emerging, we found neutron star black holes and binary neutron stars. And we definitely know that um, the first neutron star was a neutron star or a binary neutron star uh, because we saw the um, uh, we saw the flash basically we saw the kilonova and the gamma ray burst when they merged. Okay, so um, those are our summary results. I'll go through them again at the end. Um, now I just want to show you kind of a guide to the data analysis and um, and what the signals look like in multiple different domains. So you find yourself switching back and forth between the time and the frequency domain a lot in gravitational waves. So uh, I put them out of order here. The time domain is over here. Um, frequency domain is over here. So uh, on the right hand side, our first detection was very, very short. So these are all start, they start at maybe 20 or 30 hertz. Um, and then what happens, we'll see it on the next slide, but they chirp up to frequencies. Basically the gravitational waves drive this system together and then it's going to merge. Um, and uh, ring down. So this was quite massive, and so it evolves very quickly just because the large masses mean that it emits a lot, so it will collapse faster. This will take a longer time to evolve, and then um, this uh, third one down here is quite a bit longer, uh, still in the black hole range, and so it will take many cycles to evolve. And um, I don't think the colors are very well matched here, but um, this is what we'll look at in the frequency domain. <laughs> Essentially, you've got this kind of, uh, it's on the left-hand side, this slope down. I, it gets louder as the signal gets tighter, as the orbit gets tighter, but it spends less time there. So you get this kind of thing where the lower frequencies are weighted more. And then when it turns here, it's because the it's going from in-spiraling, where the two things are just orbiting into each other, to actually plunging and merging. And so then this will merge and bring down. And the, uh, the lower the mass is, the higher the frequency that will happen now. So that's basically what it looks like in the frequency domain. And then we actually tend to look more in the time frequency domain. So we make spectrograms. These are not exactly spectrograms. There's something called uh, Q-transforms. Um, this is a slightly different spectrogram. Um, so on the left-hand side, with the first detection, you can actually see it in the raw data. This doesn't always happen, but because it's so short, you can actually just uh, band pass the data. So not the raw data, you have to band pass it, but you can actually see the template fitting with the data itself. Um, and then this gives you the time frequency representation. It's chart where it goes flat here and it turns out and it merges. So here it's basically plunging and merging all at once. Um, as you get to in the middle, you're getting to larger masses, but smaller masses, sorry. Uh, it takes longer and you see uh, a longer curve. And then this is the binary neutron star that I mentioned. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can actually see because the binary neutron star is probably the closest that's ever happened in um, the last couple hundred years. Uh, we know how often gamma ray bursts go off, and even without the gra gravitational wave detectors on, we know that nothing would happen in 40 megaparsecs um, within 100 years. So we got incredibly lucky. This is an incredibly strong signal. Um, and uh, we could actually see it in two of the detectors. It was in a really bad spot for Virgo. So it was basically where Virgo was not sensitive, which meant there was a tiny little patch of the sky. So there's only one little spot where that works. And so um, there was some work done. I don't, I don't think I actually put a slide in there. Uh, we've kind of cut out a big glitch here. So the detector actually completely misbehaved and made this gigantic artifact, which wipes out this part. Um, and I don't think I actually made a slide, uh, but it was some of my code that was actually used to remove that from the signal. Um, it's a, a process called gating, and you just basically um, excise it smoothly, and uh, and that allowed them to actually figure out where the thing was on the sky and point telescopes and find it. Okay. 
So those are some results. Um, now I'm going to go into how we actually um, do the search. Or well, so there's there's two parts to it. There's the parameter. Let me start with the search. There's the search. First, we have to find that there's something there in the data. And then we have to do parameter estimation. We actually have to infer what's there in the data because everyone wants to know um, what the parameters are, the masses, uh, the spins, the orientation, anything else. Um, so this is Bayes' theorem. Uh, if you've got a model for how the data is generated from your parameters, um, so that includes both the deterministic part, the model itself, plus the noise, you need to model the noise. And we'll talk a lot about that. And then your prior is what you actually believe about the signal. Um, you put that all together, uh, do some Markov chain Monte Carlo, um, get a thousand core computer, run it for a month, um, maybe down to a day now, uh, but these are pretty expensive. Um, and then you'll get out some posteriors that tell you what you believe about the parameters and how certain you are. Um, and this is the likelihood, and it's probably familiar to everyone uh, who's taking any statistics course. You literally um, Take the data, subtract what you think is in it, out, uh, square it up, and then divide by the power spectrum. So the power spectrum, let me just go back one, two, uh, is this thing. It tells you how sensitive the detector is, and it's most sensitive to these frequencies. They're audio frequencies, really 30 hertz to 300 hertz, where you get most of the signal. And so it's least square spin. It's a nonlinear least square spin uh, for this model. I'm not going to talk too much about the model, but what I want to cover is the data. This um, likelihood is not actually all that accurate. So we're going to try to go beyond it in a couple different ways. Um, the things that we're assuming here are that it's Gaussian, that's this form, that it's e to the minus squared, uh, e to the minus whatever. <coughs> and then it's also stationary, meaning we can describe this by just a power spectrum. Uh, so the, the uh, statistics of the noise don't change in time. Um, so that's what we've been using all this time. Since the beginning of LIGO, that's basically our likelihood. And now, right now, is when we want to go on to beyond it. Um, and the reason why is because we need people to, to trust our results. So uh, it's not that I doubt anything particularly, but as we get more and more detections, as we have less and less time to look at the detector of any one of them, um, and as we really want to dig into what's in the data, it's going to be really vital to know exactly what we're doing. Um, and not just go with the simplest thing, and we do use something slightly more complicated than this, but to actually go beyond those assumptions. Um, so that's sort of what I've written here. So um, the various challenges that I want to talk about now are, first of all, that Bayesian um, parameter estimation sort of thing. Like I said, it's incredibly expensive. Um, and you just can't do it on anything more than um, where you know that there's a signal. So when we know there's a signal, we put a prior on the signal being within like a second of that or less. And we just analyze the data, and it still takes a month. Um, there's techniques to speed that up, uh, but we can't do Bayesian all the time. And it wouldn't work anyway because the data really isn't uh, Gaussian. And if you know least squares fitting, it's really susceptible to outliers. And so we just find things all the time. So what we do is effectively just match them like we we call it a search. Um, but we run on months and months of data with hundreds of thousands of templates for these signals. And we're doing something that's not quite maximum likelihood anymore. It's got a little bit of a prior in it for, for various things. The detectors kind of have to look like each other and all that. But uh, it's still not full Bayesian. And so putting more ideas from the priors and more ideas from like Bayes theorem into that will make the, the search more sensitive. And you really have to understand the geometry of signal space. I'll show you the templates and how we actually find these things. You need to understand how signals relate to each other and how to cover um, the space so that you can actually find everything. Um, and what does that actually mean? I talked about masses. We used to know how to do masses, and now we want to be able to do spins and recession. We want to be able to not miss anything. So we need to have a template signal near everything. Um, and we need an accurate noise model. The data is non stationary, non Gaussian. Um, otherwise, detections might be wrong, parameters could be wrong. Um, and we also can't ignore our priors. And I'm going to show one selection bias at the end, and it's something I want to think about more in the years going forward. 
Okay, so let me show you how we actually uh, use temple banks to find these signals. Um, so uh, th there's not a fool here just because I'm bad at drawing. Um, it's actually sort of intentional. So we're trying to lay out a, a fishing net. Uh, we've got like templates at each of these crossing points here. So that's a signal with a certain set of parameters, um, like a, a model signal. And then we've actually got our data with a signal on it and a bunch of noise. And it's going to come through here and it's got some kind of radius, right? It's, uh, you can think it's similar to every signal. It's similar to this one more than similar to that one. And in a way that can make precise by basically defining a dot product between signals. Um, it's just a dot b weighted by the um, weighted by the, the noise spectrum. So where the noise is bigger, uh, we don't weight it as heavily. Um, so we can ask like how close is this signal to any one of our templates? We project it out of this geometry the time and phase. Uh, I'll spare you all the map um, because the fast Fourier transform is really good finding these. So we don't know where it is in time, so we just take a bunch of data and start to with the Fourier transform. Um, also, the amplitude doesn't matter because you can't control that, right? It doesn't help to make your templates louder. It just, uh, just makes the noise louder too. So we're placing out of templates in a lattice or randomly. Um, and then if there's any gaps, if we get the distance wrong or whatever, then signal slip through and we miss things. So we built this billion dollar detector. And now because we didn't spend um, a couple months thinking about the math, we'll miss something, right? And the detector gets less valuable by, the, by basically the range it has queued. Because you know, the, the more sensitivity you can get, the more distance you see, but then you cube that to get the volume. And the signal so is volume. And so uh, a small increase in the mass can really pay off usually. Yep. So perhaps they're not using two dimensions the sketch. Uh, so here, yeah, I've shown yeah. two, two yeah. dimensions. So many dimensions uh, I mean, um, so the, the current template banks are four dimensions, um, two masses and two spins. Um, things like the time, like I said, are just sort of ignored. Uh, the two detectors are searched separately and then look for coincidence. Uh, and then we're now just starting to have template banks that can handle perception, in which case you'll have uh, three or four different parameters, I think, um, because of how that, uh, effectively you can't see some of them, so they don't really matter. Um, but that also perception, because it depends on which way the, the binary is pointing, also brings in this, the uh, orientation of the binary. And so you actually get more parameters than you think. So maybe it's something like five. Um, eccentricity would add two. Uh, tidal forces will add more once we're sensitive to those. So yeah, we're, we started off with uh, just the masses. Um, yeah, but then, then there's two, I believe, there's not. Um, sorry, is that the most? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so, uh, one thing that I did, this was basically, I started at Syracuse, but it really paid off once I was at Penn State. Um, I was working with someone who built the first temple bank. So, the first, the map of the temple bank to do masses, I was done by Ben Owen, um, and Staff of the Patch, and a couple others. Um, but no one had ever been able to spin into this. Uh, and so basically, we were searching just for masses. Um, so we set the spins to zero. Uh, and if something had a lot of spin, then we wouldn't be able to find it. Um, it turns out that there's actually a geometry to this. So uh, I didn't write out the whole series, but you can think of the um, that waveform as basically a series in m times f uh, to one third. And each term kind of comes in at a different uh, order. So the M chirp that I talked about that comes in the first order, and then the mass ratio comes in the next order, and then just the order past that is the spins. And so they, they're hard to tell apart, um, but they also correlate with each other. And then you've got more and more corrections going on. And it turns out you can just sort of write this in a way that it becomes a 12 dimensional metric, um, which is flat. So instead of doing this very curved metric that depends on these parameters um, and correlate with each other, you can generate it in a higher dimensional space. Um, this is impossible to show on the board, but what we have here is like one template and it's distance, but in the distance space, essentially the manifold of signals is dense, right? Um, but we can sort of go into this higher dimensional space and figure out where the manifold of signals sits and then lay a lattice that, that follows it as close as possible. It turns out it doesn't curve very much. It curves a little more than we want. Uh, and also some dimensions don't really matter. 
So we create a three-dimensional effectively lattice that covers the M turf, the mass ratio, and the dominant part of the spin. And it actually works really well, um, except I can never plot it because it's three-dimensional. Um, but here is sort of what it looks like. Um, so these are just the masses. You got your binary neutron stars and your star black holes and your binary black holes. Up here, because we've got the merger, this doesn't actually work. And so we're covering this for the stochastic method, uh, just randomly placing them and, and seeing if there's overlap. Uh, but down here, we're doing a geometric method. This is where the bulk of the templates lie. So actually, for the binary black holes, you don't need much of a method at all. Just a few templates is enough. Um, but actually, in the next part of the, you know, in the next couple of years, this is going to expand more. The merger is going to matter less. Uh, this is the way the sensitivity is checked to go. So the geometric method is going to work more up to the, there. And we're going to have um, hundreds of thousands of templates. The other thing is, uh, if you go down to below one solar mass and try to do a sub-solar mass search, search looking for primary, primordial black holes, you need the geometric method. Um, it, it will get you, it's basically optimal. And so you can cover that, and that's no use of templates. So um, that was that was one thing we've done, and then pretty recently, uh, Ian Perry, he's the uh, one of the other two faculty members at um, Portsmouth, and I have been looking at what the title terms do. So the title terms are basically the title deformation of one black hole to the other, puts a force, force on the the orbit. Um, and if we calculate what the match looks like, it's this red thing here. Um, so that's just using the math. And if you actually just put it on a computer and brute force it, it doesn't look anything like that. So what's happening actually is that we're trying to do a quadratic approximation to a distance. And um, when the, the higher powers sort of come in, it just breaks. The problem is it's a convergence series, and convergence series converge slowly. And so you can put in uh, lambda to the fourth term. This is uh, Ian did this. I would not have gone up to 40th order. At 40th order, um, you have you can do the combinatorics of how many terms you have in your Taylor series, but it still is just not quite working. The good thing is that the tidal effect is really not measurable right now. The detectors aren't sensitive enough. There's not binary neutron stars close enough. But if we actually want to measure directly that things are neutron stars, or we want to find things with uh, very exotic equations of state, uh, we're going to need to solve this. Um, and so one way to do it is just understand um, the, the obstructions to why this approximation is not valid, um, which I, I've got some hints about. Uh, or we can do things a little more directly. So this is something, um, yeah. Uh, this is by, I, I tried to cite all the PhD students that I've worked with. Um, so this is with my current student, uh, Suzanne Green. Um, what we're doing is replacing all of that, take all, away all the math, and just generate a bunch of matches. So this is just a two-dimensional match. And once again, I can't show you more than two dimensions. Uh, and then feed it into a neural network and teach the neural network to, to learn this manifold. And it's doing it pretty well. So it's learning the match between two different waveforms. It's, it's learning basically that dot product. Um, so instead of calculating the two waveforms and doing the dot product, which is slow, we can now feed it into a neural network and you can do 10,000 of those matches in a split second. Um, I think it's a microsecond each, but it probably doesn't scale quite like that because a GPU can do one of them as fast as you can do 10,000 of them. So if you put everything on the GPU, so instead of using a, you know, just a computer, you use graphics processing unit, and you do all the calculations on the GPU. So it's calculating all the matches. It's never actually making a waveform. It's just learning the manifold. Um, this happened in about a second. It could place a temple bank. This is not a full temple bank yet. This only has 10,000, and we're going to need to do 100,000, but it's also not optimized. So essentially, with uh, covering the spin space, we can, uh, so the mass space, we can do pretty well. If we want to add spins, that's just a matter of getting the neural network to work. And then if you get any more complicated waveforms, all you need to do is calculate, I don't know, 10,000 of them, 100,000. Um, I don't think you need more than that. And it will just learn the space for you and learn to place things. So this is a stochastic method, but even a stochastic method doesn't work uh, when you go off. So it's not geometric, it's not optimal, uh, but it is pretty good. Okay, let's speed up. Um, so then 
let me just uh, go through a bunch of other things here. Uh, so now I'm switching more onto the, the noise side. So I just want to put up this example that I saw. I use it in my teaching a bunch. Um, so I'm teaching fitting, basically. So this is called Amstorm's Quartet. Uh, these data, this data all has the same statistics. But this one is aligned with noise, independent noise. This is not a line. Uh, it has no noise, but it's not really a line, obviously. This has an outlier. And then, well, this is bad data. Um, and you can think of what we're doing as just uh, nonlinear least square fitting. So our model is like this. It's kind of complicated. But you can map all of the problems that we're going to have onto this. non stationary means that these errors are not independent. Different frequency bins are not independent. So if one of these is wrong, they're all wrong nearby. And so there's a lot of correlations that have big correlation matrix to deal with. Non Gaussian just means you got outliers. It's heavy tails, so the Gaussian approximation doesn't work very well. And if you've got these more parameters, you're trying to measure that there's precession. This brings you back to the goal. It's always to find precession, to find violations of general relativity. Um, the more parameters you have, the more you're going to overfit the noise. And you have to understand the noise perfectly to, to reliably estimate something. Um, so let me then go through detector characterization. Um, this is unique to LIGO. So Remind you, I was the, the chair of the group from 01 to 03. Uh, so the. Um, and he started the day of the first detection. I that's on the next slide. Yeah. 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 So there's a lot of detector, uh, one of that's Livingston. Um, and these are all the different systems that we use to measure things. And the detector characterization chair is essentially the person who knows all of that, uh, who can tell you what any part of that is and how it works, and use it to track down any, any errors in the data. Um, let me just give you an example or two of that. Um, uh, so, right, this is, um, yeah, this, this happened, so there's like seven hours difference here. So, uh, one of the head commissioners was trying to track down the source of all these, this noise here and said, okay, it's 50 hertz. We don't know where that comes from. And they know the detector is better than anyone. Um, the detector characterization chart right back and say, okay, it's the OMC to this. That's the only thing that's precisely 50 degrees apart. This is the head of the site um, uh, who's not usually quite so uh, emotive as saying good call y'alls. But um, you can see in the red there uh, what the data looked like before this horrible, horrible line uh, noise, and then uh, fixed it. These are basically um, just oscillating the mirrors in order to find a good spot. And if you turn that down, it reduces your modulation products and um, fixes the noise. Um, yep. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about automating that in a second. Um, this was the day, you can see it's a Sunday even, uh, the day before the first detection. Um, the last thing that I had to do was basically, well, that we had to do was to track down why we couldn't do hardware injections. We would try to simulate binary neutron stars by pushing on the mirrors with our electric static actuators, and we get this gigantic glitch at the end. So a glitch is just any kind of noise artifact that's just short. They're short and loud, everyone's it. So we're trying to simulate a binary neutron star so we test end to end the system. Uh, we've got four days to go before the run starts, and uh, we don't know why. This is not working. And so I finally sorted out that it's actually just that the digital system didn't have enough range to do it. It would try to generate that part of it. It's too high frequency. It couldn't push on the mirrors. We actually couldn't push as hard on the mirrors as the gravitational wave pushes on them. Um, and I said the likely path forward in the short term is to push the masses, masses up into the neutron star black hole range. So I said basically, don't do a good fine neutron star, do a black hole, a neutron star black hole as a simulation. The next day, at lunchtime, that's exactly what I saw in the data. Uh, binary black hole, and I thought someone had read this and just done the simulation overnight. Uh, and it turned out that, you know, that's not what they did. <laughs> uh, they, no, a couple of people have read that, but they checked that that was not what happened. No. But that was, that was a fun little bit of confusion because I, I immediately saw a black hole in the data and I thought, oh, um, yeah, that's similar to my A-log. A, a log is just a, the name for the R electron flow. Um, so going back to the slide before, we wanted to automate this kind of intuition because I don't want to be staring at the data all the time. So one of the things we've done 
is uh, to correlate changes in the range of sensitivity with any signal in the detector. And here's any signal in the detector. There's 100,000 of them. Um, outside temperature, um, yeah, in fact, actually, there's the, the, the temperature in degrees centigrade and degrees Fahrenheit. So, I mean, a lot of these are correlated. And so if you actually try to fit something, you will fit basically anything. Anything the detector does, you can fit with something happening in the detector. Um, correlation, not causation, right? So uh, Marissa was a grad student, now was a professor um, at somewhere in Virginia, I think. Um, we, uh, and I think this is a mathematician from Fullerton. Uh, so with uh, a couple of mathematicians and other people, we basically look for the correlations with regression, but we use lesser regression so that you can tune it so that it's trying to sparsify. It's only trying to find one explanation. So that red line is actually what we were looking for. This is uh, a big drop in range that happened, um, equivalent to basically throwing away $100,000 worth of detector time uh, because one little chip had gone bad and started to make noise. Um, so we didn't find it at the time, but we now have this automated system that can search for it. Um, thinking of removing noise, another thing that happened was, uh, is this O2, the new high power laser shakes too much because it needs to be cool. And um, so it's basically running and cooling as fast as possible can go, so it doesn't melt itself. Um, and that was shaking the, the laser input and causing all sorts of noise. So I did, Detection range should have been 80 megaparsecs, that's what we quoted in the slide before. It's actually close to 60. So I prototyped and then um, uh, led two PhD students in uh, basically coming up with a method where we could do the entire six months of data or whatever it is by overlapping windows. So we have to compensate for the fact that the, the, the effect is changing. Um, and you can see here, it's not a great color scheme, but uh, on the bottom right, You've got the original data, original noise with all these features, and then we clean the entire run. So six months of data recalculated, um, removing all that noise by using this basically correlated witness channel, and got a range uh, 20 megaparsecs higher. So basically we covered using calculus, the difference there is. Yes. Um, <laughs> Maybe I'll skip through this fairly quickly. Um, these are just radio frequency noises, and I, I don't have that much time to start a little bit late. Um, so this is caused by a radio frequency beat note, and I just basically invented a method of tracking the radio frequencies around the site and comparing what they were to the, the laser frequency, um, which allows you to see when it piles up, and it allows you to see when you're going to get one of these whistles. And those basically can contaminate any supernova search, any kind of unmodeled burst search. Um, and then it turned out also that this just got worse. And we now starting to make things that look like binary black holes. Uh, and so you can see here that there's a whole line of these. These happen at specific frequencies. So there's, you've got this high frequency contamination, and then you've got this low frequency contamination. So this was 01 or 02. Um, and by you know, basically inventing the spot that they could look at, we could steer the frequencies to places where it wasn't such a problem. And now, just a couple months ago, they finally replaced the output electronics, and when you now sweep through, there's one line where things are going to go bad, and this is never going to happen again, um, other than that. So as long as you stay away from this one point, this has gone from a giant problem at the beginning of the run to now basically fixed. But there's a lot of things you can't fix. Um, so this is work that Arthur Tolley started as a master student with me, now he's working with the group as a PhD student. Um, this is scattered light, so it's essentially light leaving the main beam, bouncing off something, moving at a micron a second. Um, a micron a second is kind of small to everyone else, and it's huge to us, but the detector is not moving, the mirrors are not moving, everything else is moving, right? The mirrors are basically frozen in space because they're being controlled um, to, to never change distance to each other. So when the light leaves the beam and recombines, um, it's going to pick up basically a phase change, and a phase change is what we're measuring. And so you get these horrible arches, which are basically the thing swinging. So you can get swinging like that and that, and you get uh, multiple arches. So here I just plotted showing what was actually moving. 
Um, we can make a model of this. And now you can just use that as a template. This is not really anything that's been tried before. We use it as a template, we do a search, and now you can see that we've searched and we found all this, and we can actually just reverse the phase and subtract it out. So you can take months of data with scattered light and remove it. And basically, there's not much you can do if you're trying to search through this. It's very easy to think you can see a binary transfer right here. It just likes to combine those all together. But now we can just clean the data, and especially um, until we manage to fix this, and it's really hard to fix because it's hard to get light not scattered. Um, we can just remove it from the data. It's very expensive again because it's searching for as many templates as we have binary black holes. Um, so now going more towards the data analysis side. Um, non Gaussian noise, we've just really started this. It's harder than non stationary. Um, but what we need is a statistical method for understanding the outliers and the noise. And so what we come up with is basically to take one frequency given in the spectrogram, and um, it should be Gaussian. There's kind of a line here where it fits. But then you'll see you know, typically some outliers. And there's a bunch of ad hoc methods to remove the outliers and model them. But instead what you do is a Bayesian method, basically an outlier model. Um, and you can get pro posteriors on how many outliers there are. This is 3%. It doesn't look like 3%, but it is. Um, well, it says three and a half, it's actually three. Um, and then you can get the parameters of the population. And what that allows you to do is basically say, how clean is the data? Is this data going to be a problem? Um, this was invented because we thought we saw recession in one signal, and it's, we have published it, or uh, some people published it. But there are outliers there. There's glitches happening. And we're trying to clean them using you know, a variant of the noise subtraction methods. Do you want to get rid of those? But we need a very sensitive statistical method that will tell us exactly when we remove them and be confident about it. And what I really like about this is it allows us to say what we believe about the data and then infer it. Um, and the nice thing is this is three lines of code in the new Markov chain um, methods. And then um, sort of the last thing I'm going to talk about is non-stationarity. So um, the first way we tried to do this was with PST variation in research. So essentially, PSD is the noise power, the, the spectrum that we saw. And as it changes, um, you're going to get a change in the signal noise ratio that you measure. Um, because it kind of depends on the noise, the, the dot part of the noise in the template on average. Um, normally, we just do this average mathematically, and it comes out to just a value that's fixed. But if the power spectrum is actually changing, but the signal is longer than the change in the power spectrum, we need to search over time with the changing power spectrum. So we actually just take the ratio of the, the one that we're using with the one that actually is, if we can track that, and we get a dynamic normalization factor, which means that when you've got data like this, you can identify that it's going to cause a burst of noise, and then you can remove it from the search. You can not remove the data, not throw it away, but actually downweight it so it doesn't cause uh, outliers. And you can see just how bad our data is, because this is what it should look like over two weeks of data, and then you get this long tail after that. So you've got lots of times when the power spectrum, when basically the SNR is twice as high as it should be. And we can just sort of now run through data that we couldn't before. But if we really have bad data around the time um, of, uh, of a signal, then we may have no choice but to analyze it and estimate the parameters. Um, so if the, the spectrum is changing, what we can do is we can try to actually measure the change. And instead of a spectrum here, instead of like a diagonal term that we had before, we now just get a full matrix. And a full matrix has n square components if there's n data points, and that's too many to estimate. You can't estimate the noise from the data. So we need to use these matrix factorization methods. We basically need to find the modulation of the data along with the, um, the spectrum of the data, and then matrix factorize it. Uh, I won't go into the math of that, but it works pretty much. We can get the modulation. It's still hard to get a spectrum. We mostly use flat spectra right now. But now we know what sort of is in the data. Um, so this is where the PhD student already who turned his thesis a little while back. Um, and uh, we've published one paper and we've got two more waiting. And the next thing to do is basically to, to track more complicated data, so this is real noise um, where we're tracking it, that's another case of real noise, and basically just build methods that can track the, data, track the changes in the spectrum um, 
and then compensate for it when we do the uh, the um, uh, the markup chain Monte Carlo. So last thing here. Um, so this is uh, here. Uh, so this is we were looking at the effect of an isolated point mass uh, micro lens. Um, so that depends on, and, and this is like kind of jumping uh, topics very quickly, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, selection effects. So the effect of microlensing is um, you can depend on the lens map and the equation. Tool. So you've got, you know, this is in solar masses, 100, 1,000, 10,000. Um, and then Y is basically how close it approaches to the lens. Uh, and so um, we, we took sort of uh, Helena and Oleg's um, paper about lensing uh, put together with some of our code uh, for LIGO uh, and Virgo and um, found this kind of nice curve that, uh, that kind of gives the magnification. So this is the effective magnification that we get. And it's actually really simple. It doesn't really care what the detector is or what the signal is. Um, there's just three regions um, where you can see lensing. And then this is the match. This is basically how much a, a signal that's not lens looks like a signal is lens. So here it's 80 percent, 70 percent. When it's 98 percent, even if the, the signal's lens, you can't tell because it has no effect on the signal. There's no change to it. But down in these regions, that's where the signal doesn't look like a normal signal. So these are the places where you actually can detect lensing. But these are much rarer down here because the, the angle of approach has to be very close than they are up here. So here's a big integral that kind of says all that. Um, but the important thing is that normally it's just assumed that this is like y dy, that it's, it's kind of like a quadratic here. But because in these regions you can see much further, and because things are more detectable, if you're doing your parameter estimation, you really need to weight the fact that um, you can see much further when it's lensed. So the more lensing you get, the further you can see. So uh, I guess it's, yeah, this is the integrand of it. But the further out it goes. Um, so this is actually, yeah, this is like the density of, uh, of your prior. So your normal prior is going to be y dy, or y squared. Um, this is for all signals. But the important thing is when you go to signals that have a smaller match, or like a really small match, it turns out that it really weights things at not very low y and not very high y, but things in just at this very sort of critical path where you know, there's very specific range of modifications to the waveform that you can both see and that are likely. And when they actually do the searches for these, they do not use that prior. They use a prior that's completely different than this. Um, so the next step is for us to actually talk to the lensing group and start building this prior into our searches. And what that does is now it weights the things that are actually detectable as lensing. Um, so not the things up here where, yes, it's lensed, but you can't see it. We weight the things that are actually very likely. And then this gives us a higher chance, probably not very high for 04, um, but for 05 and later, to actually see lensing. How much time do I have left? Three minutes. Three minutes. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just go through these really, really quickly. I mentioned uh, research software engineers. I just want to get a pitch for how great they are. There's a new kind of, they're basically, this is a group that I'm leading. We've got four of them so far. Uh, and they're like postdocs, except they're not tied to any one project. They're software engineers who also have PhDs in physics and know how to do research. So what we use them for are things like our UK Space Agency funding. They do coding for LISA, which I didn't um, put the name of there, uh, Euclid, and also for PyCBC, which is our, our main software for using for analyzing the LIGO data. Um, and so one person will switch between that project and that project. We've got three of them on Euclid now. But once we do our coding for the, the, the programming for ESA itself, they'll be ready to exploit the data. So the scientists at, um, at the ICG can then go to them for help analyzing data. And they also allow us to do a bunch of innovation things. Um, 
people can ask me about this later. I don't have time to go into it. Uh, the, they can analyze the data from a race around uh, Great Britain uh, with these little rowboats where they took uh, four terabytes of hydrophone recordings um, and found dolphins and all sorts of ship noise. Um, we do things like build uh, gigantic photometry models that cover 100,000 square degrees and measure the depth of water from satellite images over uh, years of data, um, and then use that to find seagrass as well. Um, so that's just a, a, a brief pitch. Uh, people can talk to me more if they want to know uh, things about um, research. Why you get, you get thanks from important locations for all this small part of the yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'll just finish off there. Um, Right. This is just to remind you what our detections look like and what's coming up. So 04 is going to start, probably not March, it's going to be a little bit later, but we're going to expect lots of detections. And, uh, and in 05, we're going to see even more things if we get our upgrades. We've got now just, we've filled in a pretty good range of things. We're looking for things lower. Maybe, probably not. Some of lap holes will be down here. We're probably going to see them. Hope to see more binary neutron stars, and obviously we want to see some of the electromagnetic radiation. Fill the upper mass gap, see some intermediate match black holes. We want to start seeing some kind of spin. You can see most of these spins just sit around zero. Um, uh, but really, um, I think let's just skip that and go to the conclusion here. Um, what we're going to have is detection is going to be one per day, so we need to give up with the data. We want to see precession, eccentricity, that means globular cluster formation. Uh, we want to see strong microlensing tidal effects. And I mean, the old effect would be beyond general relativity effects. But what we really need to do is understand the data really carefully. And I've, I've talked a lot about LIGO. Virgo is very similar. We work together very closely. Um, all the data is shared. So what we need is really an exquisite understanding of the data to make just an airtight case for any of these, especially these things where, I mean, these we're not sure about. These are there, but we don't know how strong. Tidal effects definitely there. Beyond our relativity, we just have no idea what the fire is. We don't know what to look for. And if you don't know what theory you're looking for, remember that analogy with the fitting of a line, you tend to overfit. And the more parameters are, the harder it is to find anything. So you need to control your understanding of the data and the analysis. Um, and there are new methods that combine computation. I've shown a lot of Bayesian things. Um, but also the domain knowledge of exactly how the detector works. And putting those together is really crucial to doing any of this. Thanks. All right, we have time for some quick questions. If people uh, that are online can raise their hands, and I can see that there are questions there as well. But we start here. Yeah. How dependent are you physically uh, on the shape of the players? Is it Gaussian? Is it uniform? Or what do you mean? Um, so the, the priors depend, it depends on what parameters, um, things like the sky position, basically just uniform on a sphere, um, uh, with the masses, it's pretty much flat, but as we understand more about what's actually out there, we'll switch more towards the population modeling. So there's currently population modeling that goes in and takes all the results and puts it together and figures out that there's a peak at 30 solar masses and 10, and then we can put more of that information into the priors and detect more things. But it does, if we put that into the priors, then we just detect the things that we think we see. So there's there's independent groups like the uh, Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton who have different priors and they see different things. So the understanding that is key. And the thing about, I'm not happy with the spin priors because they're very sort of isotropic and um, the magnitude could be anything. And we can measure that the least well. So. Masses and spins, the fires are really just uncertain. Um, other things are more physical. But yeah, they're, they're not really Gaussian. But... So we have a question from your day online. I think if you unmute, you can just uh, speak up to the speaker. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Andy, Jordi here. So uh, I have two questions about the data analysis that you discussed. Uh, the first thing is that, uh, you know, what the, the an issue that uh, came up when searching for events and doing this data analysis is the presence of glitches in the data. So you have to try to remove these glitches uh, to because they are, they really 
meaning that it's not Gaussian noise and there's different ways of uh, you know try to identify them removing them so I wanted to ask what uh, what is your method for dealing with these and what's your future expectations about improving these uh, and the second question is about uh, you know the the LVC collaboration has also presented papers about uh, searching for signals that are continuous rather than events basically like uh, for sources like for example I think uh, you know uh, um, some kind of irregularity in the crust of neutron stars that could produce a continuous gravitational wave for rotation and some things like this so is this what's the relation of these to what you presented for uh, these searches okay thanks um so yeah starting with the glitches it depends on the type of glitch um there's i guess the three things you can do um one well mainly you want to understand it so you want to understand the mechanism um i've got the radio frequency glitches so that was really searching around and we understood that there were frequencies that were mixed and you could um you can't really see it very well in the plot but there's a line over this whistle glitch and it follows it perfectly because we understand exactly what's happening it's the, the radio frequency feed note um and so the first thing you can do is just know that it's there know how strong it is you can do a little bit of a model and understand how much it's going to affect your data and then just be careful right well, if you think you see something you know how much it affects um the next thing is to actually use the physics of it. So if you have a good physical model, even if there are uncertainties, like there's a lot of uncertainties here, like uh, for the scattered light, like the height of the arch and the repetition rate and the amplitude of the phase. But if you can build a model, you can use um, a search or even parameter estimation to model that and remove it. It's expensive and slow, but that will allow you to cover your data. Um, you can also use that as a model to determine how much you should trust your data because you can now do a dot product of this with the signal and see how much it would affect the signal. And the last one, just going back to here, um, is we can work very hard figuring out what's going on, make a bunch of plots that convince the people at the sites what's happening and let them experiment, iterate with them. So really, like as detector characterization chair, I was an expert at speaking the language of both data analysis and talking to people at the sites and telling them what to find. Um, and how to uh, how to hunt them. And now, if you were to look at LIGO's data, all of this stuff, all the sorry, you can't see what I'm circling, but basically, uh, all of those uh, blue dots are now gone because we understood it and built a, a system to replace it. So those are really the ways of uh, th that's the best way to get rid of the glitches. But it requires a lot of work. Um, talking about the other types of searches, you're right. So I didn't actually mention the other three. Um, I'll put that up because. There's the unmodeled burst search, which, which is basically you can find black holes, but it can find anything like a supernova or whatever. So that's a short transient event where we don't have a good model of it. Um, those are very much affected by these, and so they're very interested in, uh, in us hunting those down. There's a continuous wave search, which is just a spinning pulsar. So it basically looks like a sine wave that's slowly spinning down. Um, so you're looking at a year of the data, looking for a very, very weak sine wave with a very, very small f dot, um, just like a normal pulsar search. So that's a completely different method. It's kind of every problem that we have in the time domain, they have in the frequency domain. So we talk a lot with them about getting rid of lines and things. Uh, so it's match filtering. The codes are similar, but the, the approaches aren't. The interesting thing about that is actually for LISA, the, uh, the space antenna coming up in 2035, is that a lot of in spirals, like white dwarf in spirals, will look much more like these because we don't live long enough to see the inspire actually happening, the frequency will just slowly change. So a lot of the methods that they're developing there um, are going to be really useful in these And the last one is actually the stochastic noise. So just cross correlating the detectors and looking for either an astrophysical background that's far enough away that we can't see individual things or actual remnants of like the cosmic microwave background, but gravitational waves. Um, so I don't expect to see that anytime soon, but other people might. Okay, any other questions? Thanks. Oh, it's not less than uh, Andy again.